This is Liquid Gold. All right, where the topic is soda and the inspiration is Yoda. Welcome back to Liquid Gold right here on WeOwnThisTown.net, the We Own This Town podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Wolf. Today with you, talking soda today with Soda Fountain, historian, legend, chemist, meets the bar legend, Darcy O'Neill. We made the joke a few times talking about this episode that uh, when all else fails in America, let's look to Canada. And so we called a Canadian who's super smart to talk about beverages. Darcy is the saint of soda, (laughs) as I would like to call him, because he's the last person left who's making acid phosphate, a famous uh, soda shop ingredient, and lactart, which uh, which is also from the old soda shops acid these are both uh solutions chemical solutions that aid the taste of beverages it's that simple it's almost like using a saline solution or or something like that uh there are minerals in these solutions that make things taste better we're gonna get into it with darcy plenty uh acid phosphate lactart and a lot of other things darcy also had a really cool project where he brought back the old Abbott's Bitters. He found the old recipe online or did some research, looked in some books, found what he believed to be the old Abbott's Bitters recipe. Now, Abbott's Bitters was the bitters, um, more popular than Angostura for a while. Abbott's was in the original Manhattan recipe. And to make the recipe work, Darcy had to go hunt for cinnamon down in St. Croix. So he's going to tell that story. He talks about the Angostura phosphate, one of the most famous um, old school soda fountain hangover remedies. And there's actually a role that Nashville plays in Darcy's stories as one of his biggest customers was Nashville's own, the pharmacy. And still is to this day. They're still ordering plenty of uh, acid phosphate and lactart from Darcy that he makes in Canada, just north of Toronto, living out in the country there. So this was exciting. Uh, Darcy's been an influence of mine for years, going on almost 10 years. His orgeat recipe, which we talk a little bit about, is one of the best orgeat recipes out there. So you can find that on his website, artofdrink.com, where you can buy his book, Fix the Pumps, all about old soda fountain um, methods, preparations, extracts, the history. It's just a fascinating book. Love it. Um, so all that's on his website. You can purchase the acid phosphate and lactart from him. And he's got a bunch of cool writings on there about everything from milkshakes to, uh, different soda preparations to plenty of cocktail stuff. Um, the dude knows his cocktails as well, was a bartender for a long time and was, he's really the guy. That's why he's, he's done all these, um, presentations at Tales of the Cocktails. He's like the chemistry meets the beverage world bar world dude he's the guy so amazing talking to him and then we've got a cool little booze news anecdote with kenneth deadman about lebron james switching from coke to pepsi which you don't hear much anymore you don't really hear anyone like actually i'm going to pepsi it was a it was a thing back in when ray charles was doing it back in the 90s but uh you don't see a lot of it now so uh kenneth has that report later today and uh We thought egg cream was such a big topic for the old soda fountains. Egg cream is one of the drinks to have uh, lasted this long from the old soda soda parlors. Egg creams are still made quite a bit in New York City. And we thought that that was a topic to carry over to to our next episode. We'll be doing a shots all on egg cream. So we've got all this soda and soda fountain content here. It's dry January, but uh, I'm not really participating. A lot of my friends who usually do it aren't participating, but I know a lot of people are out there and there's some great books out there about it. Cheers if you are doing that. This episode is for you. You can talk, we can talk all about soda and different uh, different methods that you can use to make better cocktails, mocktails, non-alcoholic drinks, Italian sodas. So let's turn things over to our interview with Darcy O'Neill from Art of Drink, maker of acid phosphate and lactart. So what a thrill this is to have on the line uh, a hero of mine, a beverage hero of mine, and a great writer, great mind. And I figure if since everything's falling apart in America, let's talk to a really smart guy from Canada. This is Darcy O'Neill on the line. How are you doing? Well, I'm good. I'm 
a lot quieter than it used to be with the way things are. But Do you look at everything that's going on in America and are you just used to being like, what the hell is going on down there? Or what, like, what do you make of what is going on down here politically and culturally um, as a Canadian? <laughs> uh, well, Canada's always had a, like, Canada and the United States are, you know, brothers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can have a family member that's having a few issues, but you still love them. <laughs> so, I mean, that's basically how it feels. We, we see that you're having problems, we're there for you. <laughs> Um, but you guys have to solve, you know, the person who's in trouble needs to solve their problems, but we'll be there for a winter. We're uh, all better. I love but, that. Uh, yeah, no, and you might let, the, you might yeah. let a lot of us move up there at some point if, you know, if we need to. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but, uh, we are more liberal here. So it, uh, it's one of the things that, you know, things are awesome when, you know, you have healthcare and that type of stuff. So we don't often understand why you guys fight about that so much because everybody having health care just makes everything so much easier yeah it's people have a hard time advocating for their own self-interest here yeah and when you're young and healthy it's great you, know, you don't want to pay anything but here you don't even worry about it like uh, my wife as we said earlier is the doctor and you know she her practice she doesn't even need to chase anybody down for billing because the only person they bill is the government and it doesn't mean you can't get stuff so the government pays for most things, but if it's outside of that, like if cosmetic surgery, for example, you still get that. Yeah. You, know, you just have to pay for it. We're the crazy uncle or like the crazy brother that you just, a lot of times you just probably don't want to yeah. pick up the phone. You're like the brother. You love hearing from them, but you're like, <laughs> man, get yourself together. <laughs> <laughs> you're a great hang. You're a lot of fun to party with, but Jesus, you got to get your life yeah. together. <laughs> Yep. That's great. I'm supposed to have benders on weekends. <laughs> we'll never learn, man. Uh, you probably will. Yeah. You know, you're just a younger brother, let's say. Yeah, let's say that. Yeah. How has uh, coronavirus up there in Canada, where you're at, in kind of a rural area, how has that, uh, how has that affected uh, you? It, it's a little smoother than in big cities, but my wife's actually a doctor, so she deals with. Uh, a lot with it, but there's not a lot of cases in this area, so we've been kind of lucky. We haven't been uh, heavily locked down, though they're starting to do a little bit of it, but we still had a you know a fair amount of freedom to keep our sanity. Well, that's good. Yeah, my wife is a, is a nurse in the ER here in Nashville, so she's seeing a lot of it. It's pretty yeah, intense it's in there. Up. So you're such a, I feel like an important figure and, and just such an interesting figure in that you are sort of a part of the bar world in terms of your influence and stuff and, and the products that you've made over the years. Your book, Fix the Pumps, which is available on your website, artofdrink.com. Um, your book, Fix the Pumps, which talks about the history of the soda parlor, the history of the soda fountain. What what was it about soda parlors and soda shops for you? Was it like childhood memories? Was it just something that fascinated you as a chemist? Because you have a chemistry background, correct? Yeah, so what, uh, well, what what led you to write the book? Um, the, the chemistry part of it. So I had studied chemistry. At the time, I was working at the University of Western Ontario. But I went down to Tales of the Cocktail, and it, it was the 2009 Tales of the Cocktail. And I was having breakfast with Chris McMillan, a well-known bartender. Anybody who's in the industry would know him. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he'd gone to New Orleans. And he asked me a question about acid phosphate. And... He just knew I had the chemistry background and we'd done some stuff before. So I said I'd go back and look it up. And working at the university, I had access to all sorts of libraries. And as soon as I started digging through these old pharmacy manuals, I was just, you know, floored at how much chemistry there was in it. And it just kind of seemed right up my alley. It seemed uh, if somebody was going to write about the old soda fountain proper, as in the old chemistry part of it, uh, it seemed to have fallen in my lap. And then... Uh, once I started writing the book, it was just things that people hadn't talked about for like a hundred years. So yeah. It seemed like something that was just needed to be talked about. Yeah, because there's just not that much information out there. And most of it was pretty simple. Like the Italian soda idea of just adding syrup to soda water and, you know, maybe a little citric acid or lime juice. That was basically the idea of a soda And prior to me writing about it. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that complicated. It's not that compelling. You know, there's not really something in there that like a modern bartender would uh, grasp onto. So I think one of the things that's that's 
so fascinating about the book is you see how the worlds of kind of the bar world with bitters and different spirits. Um, we talked a bit on the show last week, kind of in in previewing this episode. Um, we were talking brunch cocktails, and I talked about the uh, the ammonia coke, which is in your book, correct? Uh, yeah, it's a fantastically yeah, it is, and I've written about it on Art of Drink too. And it's just such a weird drink, but it actually tastes pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We I would make it for regulars or for friends and uh it was such a fascinating drink and but it's so what's so fascinating is how the world of cocktail bars and the soda fountain how they sort of blended for a little while there and what was really a fascinating time people start using extracts uh, dave wonders and i did actually a a session at tales of the cocktail i think it was like 2012 but it was he represented the bar side and i represented the, the soda fountain side and we talked about all the crossovers uh, because the soda fountain used to use brandy a lot, and, you know the bitters definitely, and then but there were certain areas where the soda fountain and the bar never really crossed over. But nowadays, like uh, there's so many highballs that use you know Coke or you know Seven Up or you know it's almost like a soda fountain because if you think of the number of drinks that use soda water, there's a lot of them for sure. And also, I think what's so fascinating about your book is how there's all these different extracts and things that people were using in these different recipes. See, that's the part that got me. That's the when I started researching this. If this was like, it was almost like a to-do list. Of, I have to make all of these. <laughs> there's just so many of them, and some of the ingredients like you can't use them nowadays because uh, it's slightly toxic. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, this idea that um, one of my favorite was this thing called aromatic tincture. Mm. And uh, it's basically aromatics, but without the bitterness. And so it seemed like something that um, you didn't really need to make a full bitter out of it, but it was just aromatic essence. And it was just basically made the same way you'd make a bitter without like the bitter roots like gentian. Yeah. And I was playing with that when I was bartending, and uh, it was kind of, um, it was a really easy way to add like a pop to a drink, like something... You know, unexpected because you could use so many different aromatics for it. Yeah, what? How? How did you make yours? Uh, what was all in your aromatic tincture? Uh, you usually use like uh, cinnamon oil and lemon oil and mostly essential oils because they were just, um, but nothing bitter. You know, uh, so one of the things that pharmacists are, they were called chemists back in the eighteen hundreds did was that they just extracted the oils with alcohol out of. Um, whatever herb or spice they were working with. And then they try to dry, not make it bitter. Mm-hmm. So then when they have these distilled oils, uh, they wouldn't make a drink bitter. Because most sodas aren't bitter. They tend to be sweet. And, you know, Coca-Cola is slightly bitter, but, you know, most people wouldn't even pick up on that. Right. But it's this idea that if you have a really, like, gentian liqueur, and, uh, that's actually what I'm drinking right now. But Oh, yeah, cool. It would go really well. Yeah, it'd go really well with, like, an aromatic tincture if you wanted to mess with it. Because it doesn't need any more bitterness. And so instead of dashing more bitters into a bitter drink, you could actually just add this aromatic tincture and put, like, um, cinnamon or, you know, lemon oil or a combination of them. Maybe. Yeah. Eventually, um, this 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 talk about acid phosphate, and it kind of took, took you down the rabbit hole, um, as mm-hmm. it were, in the library there. And then come to find that, that later on that you you are producing acid phosphate and did you do that because you because no one else would and no one else did and you were like somebody needs to do this this stuff is really cool yeah that's basically what happened was that there were so many drinks that use this in these old pharmacy manuals that um it had to be done so but what happened was that the old recipes weren't so there's an old patent for it back in late 1868. So that's where, but what I did is I reverse engineered the, the old patent because it, it, it actually dissolved, it used um, bone ash, which, you know, is, uh, I'm not vegetarian, but I prefer <laughs> not to put bones in my um, products. Yeah. So I just reverse engineered it from uh, the way they made it and then calculated, you know, chemistry helps, but I calculated, I back calculated all that to get the recipe. And just bought the uh, food grade salts from a chemical supplier, 
and it basically uses calcium, magnesium, and potassium phosphates um, with an excess of phosphoric acid. And as long as you get the pH right, it, it, it works great. And that's that kind of um, tingle to the drink. I guess that's the best way people describe it. Yeah, it's sort of like adding a lemon or lime or a pinch of something like that without that flavor of yeah. that ingredient. Yeah, it doesn't have the essential oil component. It's just sour. but And the salts also kind of enhance flavors. That's the, the neat thing about it is that it's just not the, the, the acidity. Is that, um, and it's not like sodium chloride salt. It, it's kind of got this different saltiness to it. That's fascinating. Yeah, so that that's definitely a, it's like a little seasoning for cocktails. Yeah, because like even in Fix the Pumps, I wrote about um, mineral salts, and technically acid phosphate is mineral salts as well. What were some of the drinks that you remember seeing that uh, from back in the day that were using acid phosphate that really kind of perked your ears up? Well, well the one that I always talk about is the Angostura phosphate, and that one, just a simple one, is like uh, half an ounce of well, two teaspoons, half an ounce, yeah, somewhere in that range, of Angostura bitters, uh, some lemon oil, or lemon syrup made from simple syrup and lemon oil, so not fresh squeezed lime, or lemons. Mm-hmm. And then some, uh, that's the sweetness part. And then, you know, four dashes of acid phosphate, and then just a couple splashes of club soda. And it's, all of a sudden, it makes this drink like, it was just fantastic, like the flavor wise, because Angostura is so intense, and then the lemons there to give it brightness, and the acid phosphate adds to it. But it, it was always marketed as a hangover cure. <laughs> so, um, being in this industry, there's always that attraction to find, you know, the, the miraculous hangover cure. For sure. And uh, it was, but uh, uh, I could tell you it doesn't work for hangovers. <laughs> More alcohol usually doesn't work. People just like to say it does. Yeah, the hair of dogs want the way to go. Well, as a chemist, what is the way to go? Just water? Uh, yeah, and if you drink coffee, drink coffee. So you'll see a whole bunch of things every New Year's where they say, oh, don't drink coffee because caffeine's a diuretic, and that'll make you more dehydrated. But it's a, caffeine's a really light diuretic, and if you actually drink coffee and consume caffeine, whether it's Red Bull or Monster or Energy Drink or any of those, your body adapts. And it's not a diuretic anymore. But if you've ever given up coffee or accidentally bought decaf mm-hmm. instead of your regular coffee, and you get that, uh, you, you'll get a little grumpy and get a hangover, like, not a hangover, but uh, you definitely feel edgy when you don't get your caffeine hit. For sure. So anybody who's got a hangover and then all of a sudden they skip caffeine, like, it's just going to compound the issue. So it's perfectly fine to drink your coffee in the morning. Don't follow that old advice that it's a diuretic because it's not. Yeah. Not in any significant way. So drink your coffee and eat a big fatty meal full of, you know, sausage and eggs. There you go. Grease because, well, what happens is that actually release, uh, releases dopamine because it's just so delicious. Mm-hmm. And that dopamine buzz will give you a little bit of a, a little bit of a break on the hangover and then sleep the rest of the day. That's good advice. <laughs> That's good official advice yeah. from Darcy O'Neill. How did you come to bartending? Was this something you were doing while you were in school um, and then and then like you came back to it? Or tell me about your bartending no, career. I, I came really late to bartending. So I had graduated in 1993 and then I worked in a refinery for seven years, a research center. And then they did some downsizing. So I moved to um, the city of Sarnia that I worked in, which is kind of near Port Huron, just north of uh, Detroit. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to London, Ontario, which is like an hour away from Sarnia. And uh, I kind of bounced around between some jobs, you know, sometimes finding a new job is a little bit hard in the chemistry world, finding something that you like. Mm-hmm. So uh, I found, I ended up working at the university, but part-time I did a job share. And to balance out the rest of the job share, I decided to work bartending. If you've ever worked in a lab, it's kind of boring. It's, uh, it's a lot of repetitive work and you know, verifying everything. So it's not the most exciting job. Yeah. And I decided I need a little bit more fun in my life. So in bartending, it seems like a fun job. So I ended up uh, doing some contracting or some contract bartending in 2003. And then I picked up a couple of uh, part-time jobs. And then I 
basically worked on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays bartending, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays in the lab, and it, it worked out. It was, you know, the perfect balance. And then I started writing about it mm-hmm. in 2004. So the, the first thing I got published in was the uh, Journal of the American uh, Nexologist, mm-hmm. which is like, I think it's released in 2004. But I wrote a, an article on uh, a simple syrup, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but... Um, in hindsight, people seem to really like that, that it still comes up in conversations, that that's kind of the type of article people or that science approach people like. That. What what point were you making about simple syrup? Was it about the cold process versus heating it up, or was it about shelf life? Uh, all of it. it was, basically, I did like, I don't know, three or four pages on it. <laughs> and, um, but the idea was that um, one of the, the, the key thing was to standardize your simple syrup. So some people make one-to-one, some people thought four-to-one was good, some people make three-to-one, and I was a fan of the Mm two-to-one, because it's almost one teaspoon of liquid simple syrup is almost one teaspoon of powdered sugar. So there's an equivalence there. So you know how much sugar you're putting into your drink, because if you ask somebody how much sugar you're putting in your drink with a one-to-one, they don't actually know. Mm -hmm. They know how it makes the drink taste, but you know, when you're trying to... um, figure things out, if you have a reference point of one teaspoon to one teaspoon, uh, liquid to powder, it helps you when you're making drinks. And that was kind of one of the early things with early bartenders in that early 2000s period were looking to change everything from being super sweet Mm -hmm. to, you know, the the subtly bitter and bringing down the sugar levels from the 1980s levels. And uh, there was this kind of interest in, you know, knowing what you're working with. This is just pose free pouring, you know, simple syrup in a cocktail. That must have been really interesting, uh, the juxtaposition of your, of your life at that point where it was like, I imagine, lo- you know, bright light and a lab coat and a very sterilized environment and everything's measured to the T and checked again and then the la- the la- the latter part of the week, you're at a a bar that's darker. The measurement mm-hmm. is haphazard. Sometimes the uh, you know sometimes, the yeah. the vibe is different. You know, it's like that must have been very interesting. Oh, it, it was, and uh, that's actually kind of why I started writing Art of Drink. Uh, you know, my blog for that was the the kind of the period where like I have to document this because this is just kind of. You know, I can use my science skills and, you know, you know, wearing a lab coat and bright fluorescent light. And, you know, I, I, I was actually working at the time in, it was called molecular histology or molecular pathology and histology. And uh, during the day, I was actually cutting up uh, research tissue. So I was dealing with brain material and kidneys from, you know, patients and, you know, research subjects and animals. And... I had to do really fine detailed work with it. Like we're cutting things at five microns Mm. and you know, you you spend a lot of time focusing on this because you know, you can't mess up samples. Like if you really care about your science, you're very accurate. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of thinking. And then I'd go to the bar and you know, five o'clock starts and you know, you've got everything set up and people come in on a Friday night. It's like, you know, a tourist bus unloaded at the front and all they want to do is have fun. And if you are not having fun, they're not having fun. So you just got to let loose. And it was uh, it was good for me, actually. It was like therapy. Yeah, that's like a great balance, I would imagine. It was. And uh, I did that for like oh, almost 10 years, right? nine years. So that, was that the end of your, your bartending career, aside from like doing some festivals and things like that? Well, I think I stopped bartending in 2012. Uh, by that time, I had had... I have two kids now, and my daughter was born in 2009. My son was born in 2007. So the working until 3, 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, it, uh, that just gets you when you have kids and you have to get up in the morning. Like, yep. It becomes a priority. And it, uh, I had written Fix the Pumps by that point, and that was doing well. Acid phosphate was doing well. So I had to, you know, I decided to focus on actually just the drinks industry. So... I left the university and I left bartending and I've just been doing writing and, you know, child rearing and selling acid phosphate and lactart. That's great. Yeah, we're going to get to lactart in a little bit. Are you, so I was working at Holland House here in Nashville going back to about, I guess it was 2011 and they went on to open the pharmacy back there, which I imagine they're still, are they still ordering your acid phosphate? 
Yeah, actually, uh, they're probably one of the best customers I have. Uh, See, that's amazing. They used to, but, yeah, they used to order like every two weeks, like a thirty-six bottle case. Like they were excellent customers, I mean, it, uh, they still do, but they don't order as much. But I mean, times change. But yeah, yeah no, they were fantastic. Yeah, that's pretty incredible to think that um, the journey that you had led you to you know writing the book, reviving this acid phosphate. And then here, you know, Nashville is using a ton of it, uh, basically because of Terrell, Terrell Rayleigh. The other um, really fascinating product you make, lactart, which is essentially acid of milk. Can you tell me how, how other than just it being acid of milk, but how, how different is lactart from acid phosphate? And what were the old soda jerks, what were they using it for? So acid phosphate... Back, it's like it, it kind of was super popular in the late 1800s, and then obviously because of its popularity, everybody wants to compete with it. But uh, they wanted to create something different. So the Avery Chemical Company created lactart, and so they it's basically lactic acid, sorbitol, and a bunch of uh, salts, much like acid phosphate. They got some sodium salts and some calcium salts in it. And uh, what happened is, is it never achieved the popularity of acid phosphate, but it worked really well in like milkshakes and cream-based drinks. And uh, the obvious connection is something like yogurt or even lambic beers because they have lactic acid in it. Oh, sure. They, it's this idea that it, it kind of, it's familiar um, and people did drink it, and but it, it has a really drying effect on a drink. Um, I don't know if you've ever played with it where you've noticed that it, like, if you put it into a drink, it can really dry a drink up. And they used to actually put it in, during Prohibition, they used to put it in uh, de-alcoholized beer. Because if you ever had a non-alcoholic beer, they do have that kind of multi sweetness For sure. Yeah, they used to add some lactart someday, and you'll it dries it up, and it makes it you know more like a lambic, but oh, cool. definitely not sweet. No, we had a lot of fun using it at Husk. We used it in uh, rum drinks for some reason. We just liked it. We liked it in a lot of rum drinks. Um, and then we did play around with like egg creams and some of that stuff. We didn't like we would do really cool egg cream stuff. We wouldn't put it on the menu or anything, but we would make it for folks in the bar. What's interesting about both acid phosphate and lactart is how they came They came to be like a kind of shorthand with the soda parlor where it's like, I want a lactart. Oh, I want a pineapple lactart or I want a cherry phosphate. Mm-hmm. That whole chemistry thing was so like, it was very much appreciated back in the 1800s. Like people didn't have that fear of like a chemical name that we, some people do today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they all believe that, you know, phosphates, you know, uh, had beneficial health effects. So if you ever, have you ever read the label to phosphate? <laughs> Ted Hay actually designed it. Um, Forgotten Spirits and Cocktails. Oh yeah. Oh, your, uh, your label? Yeah. The label is designed by Ted. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. Cause, and it, but it, it's kind of funny because he has all sorts of these old terms for, uh, you know, neurological diseases and stuff, but that's what they used to think. It was beneficial for them, like a vitamin. Wow. Uh, and obviously it doesn't really do anything now and, you know, would be significant. I mean, it's not bad to get phosphates. It's actually kind of good for your teeth. But it's not like the, the health promotion that they used to do in the 1800s. That's crazy. Yeah, I found the lactart was, was just awesome, and I loved using that. I probably need to order some more from you. <laughs> your kids must just love this. Like, are you like... Oh, I make them... <laughs> soda pop dad, and you're like crushing yeah. egg creams and yeah. chocolate milkshakes with them? I don't make them so many milkshakes, but I do make them sodas. Like, the, you know, I could have like a case of pop in the garage or something. They're like, no, make me one. So, you know, it, uh, I'll just make them. And I make them pretty simple. I just find like a syrup um, or make a syrup. Like if I want to make them like lemonades in the, the summer, I just make up some lemon syrup and some leftover lime peels and a few squeezed limes. And then uh, add some carbonated water and acid phosphate and... But yeah, I tend to I tend to have a soda <laughs> a couple times a week at least. That's Only great. Scratch because they they wouldn't accept anything less from me. That's right. Wow, that's great. You're teaching them right. What uh, what do you have? So because uh, let's see, Topo Chico has gotten gotten real popular here in the states, and 
Um, it just seems to me to be such a great soda water to use for beverages where the carbonated water is a smaller part of the drink or a smaller component because the bubbles are so intense and it does have some kind of um, minerally uh, salty component to it. Do you have a favorite? I've, I've had it before. Uh, not really, but I've had it before only in, like, they don't have it in Canada, but I've had it down at Tales of the Cocktail, um, a couple times, and there's different, so one of the things that people, I guess with all things, or almost all things, is that, like, Coca-Cola dominates the market because it's one of the most flavorful sodas out there, Mm -hmm. and same with a lot of the, uh, just plain old soda waters, the ones that have a you know, more intense carbonation and a higher salt content, uh, people tend to be attracted to because it's, you know, like spicy food. You have, Once you get into the spice wheel, you keep eating more. Mm-hmm. Um, but back in the early days of soda fountains, they used to super carbonate their uh, water, like upwards of 120 PSI. Oh, wow. Like, you know, beaters somewhere around 30 um, or less. And so they used to... So that's why these old soda fountain or the siphons were wrapped in a metal cage because those things would go off like a grenade. Wow. <laughs> but they, and they used to say that people, their eyes would water from drinking it. Oh, wow. A bunch of newspaper articles. Like, yeah. And, but if you, do you like spicy food? Uh, hot for and stuff? for sure. Yeah. And so, but you know that feeling that, you know, it hurts, but it's enjoyable. And um, the same with old soda fountain stuff and I don't think anybody really does at that level of carbonation anymore but I mean when you pour it you, it, you probably just like overflow the glass and you'd have to you know uh, figure out a way to serve it but it would be kind of difficult to work with that's amazing yeah do you know anywhere that that is is trying to take it to that level and serve stuff that's that intense because I want to go <laughs> uh, no, I th- yeah and I think See, I don't think they make the uh, soda siphons because I think that's the only thing that could handle that mm-hmm. um, at that pressure. Because those old soda siphons, if you ever hold one, they're like really heavy glass, and they got the metal cage around it. Yeah. Um, I don't think I don't think they make them to that standard anymore. And you need a special filling machine. I know in New York, there's one old soda company that makes siphons or fills siphons still. I think it's the New York Soda Company or something like that. Wow. And. Uh, I don't know if they're charging to that pressure, but uh, uh, if they are, that'd be some cool soda to have. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, well, you mentioned you mentioned Coca Cola, which is fascinating because there's this whole secret recipe to it. There were rumors, I don't remember when it was, 10, 20 years ago or something, that you know that one of the secret ingredients of Coca Cola is running out, or they you know they can't find it anymore. They're going through the rainforest or something, and they can't find this this ingredient. And you have a little bit of experience with that because you have hunted down a special type of cinnamon for a batch of Abbott's Bitters where you were you were one of the guys who revived Abbott's Bitters from the old recipe. Abbott's Bitters used to be as popular, more popular than Angostura. It was the original bitters in the Manhattan. And you had this really cool project where you brought that back. So tell me about that ingredient hunt and what, what that was like. Because I know it took you down to St. Croix, I believe. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jesse Card, who's down the bartender down there at the time, like fantastic guy. Uh, he did a lot of help with, and I'll talk about him in a minute. But, yeah. Uh, so one of the things, one of my addictions is going down research rabbit holes, and yeah. I love just looking at old information and reading old books and like solving problems that there wasn't actually a problem. <laughs> so, like you know. Abbots could have just happily never existed again, and nobody, aside from a few, would be curious. But I needed to see what it tasted like. And so you can go online and you go to Google, or patents.google.com, and you can go through patents from history. And I stumbled across, you know, these what were called bitter tonics. And they're just basically recipes for bitters. Mm-hmm. And there's about 80 to 100 of them, and you can go search them. But uh, I was going through each one. You know, so I type in bitter tonic, tonic in the search bar or medical tonic or medicinal compound. And uh, I'd be scanning all these patents and just kind of reading and curious and trying to get some, like, you know, knowledge of what bitters were like back in that time. And then I just read the patent and I stumbled across, like, uh, 
Job Abbott. I didn't really think too much, but something clicked in my brain that I should probably think more about this one. I kind of rang a bell. And then what I realized was that there's an actual Abbott on a patent for bitters. Mm-hmm. Like, could there be like a... I wasn't actually searching for Abbott's bitters. I just was, you know, stumbled across it. But, but then, you knew about the, the you knew about that old brand, right? Yeah, and I used to back in like 2003, just as I was starting to get bartending, I'd go on the uh, Drink Boy forums by like mm-hmm. Robert Hess. Mm-hmm. Uh, like there, uh, I don't even think they exist anymore online. But uh, Ted Hay used to be on there, and Gary Regan and a bunch of the, the alumni. But uh, they used to talk about it, and so that's where I, I, lear- I originally learned about Abbott's. Because it's not something you'd know unless other people knew about it. Like it, um, it was such just a weird thing for people to talk about. But Gary and uh, Ted and Robert Hess and even Audrey Saunders might have been on there. But uh, mm-hmm. they're all talking about it. And you know, I didn't know anything at that early stage. But about you know, eight years later, I stumbled across this, and then it led me down the floor. I, you know, maybe I should make some up. And then I was trying to find that one ingredient, the Canela Alba. And our, it's also called Canala Wintriana. Mm-hmm. And I ordered a lot of cinnamon from all over the world, and it was all wrong. <laughs> it was just regular cinnamon. Yeah. And there's some, every, every time I ordered it, I got it, I'd be excited. Maybe this is, because some people would call it white cinnamon. Mm. And I'd try it, and I'm like, no, that's just cinnamon. You know. And I always felt that there was like nothing connected. Like It, it just couldn't be cinnamon. There had to be something to it, because all the other ingredients were easy to get like chamomile and anise and fennel and uh, lemon peel, I think lemon, or no, orange, a bitter orange. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was this ingestion, and this one ingredient just eluded me for, like, years. But then I met Jesse Card, or he had a, um, a blog, and me being a blogger, we all chatted and stuff, and I put out feelers out there. And Actually, Robert Hess told me to uh, contact this bartender's database he set up, to see if I could find somebody who was in a region like the tropics that I could actually get some canala from. And Robert had old samples of habits that he bought off eBay. And he was kind enough to send me a sample. So I had a starting point and, uh, Ted Hay actually had some habits as well. So these people were in the loop while I was trying to figure this out. And then uh, I looked on the database, and then I came across Jesse, and I knew him from blogging, so I sent him an email. And he was going to tell to the cocktail, and so was I. I think this was like 2010, mm-hmm. 2009. And he said, I'll, uh, I, uh, I'll see if I can find some on the island. And he did, and he actually brought it up to New Orleans. So I had like, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe an ounce of this canal park. So I brought it home, and I made a, a small batch I think I made like two liters of Abbott's and then I sent some out to Ted and I sent some out to Robert Hess. And their opinion was like, well, it doesn't taste like the the hundred year old stuff we have, but it seems very familiar. Like there's something there, like it's close. Yeah. And, and once somebody says it's close and they, they're sitting on a pile of Abbott's from history, you know, you got to go out and the, the difference, like I didn't do it in an oak barrel. Mm-hmm. like the recipe called for. Uh-huh. So, like, I just did it in, like, a mason jar. And, uh, you know, I didn't add any oak. But I just wanted to see if the herbals were right mm-hmm. and the spices. And it seemed to, you know, they said it was close. So then all of a sudden I'm like, Jesse, um, how would I come down and visit you? Like, Do you think we can get, like, I need four pounds to make one barrel of this. Mm-hmm. I knew it was endangered. So we had to get permission to do it, and we had to promise to harvest it, like, uh, eco-sound and, you know, not destroy the trees. So we had to find a lot of trees, and we took, like, one strip off each tree, mm. like a, you know, a one-inch wide strip, you know, maybe a foot long. And then we had to move on to more trees to, you know, get, a, like, four pounds. We're actually crawling around in this semi-tropical woodland. <laughs> and this was um, in St. Croix. Yeah. Yeah. Which I've been there. I've been to the... There's like the the kind of island uh, beach side, and then there's like the tropical uh, rainforest side. Yeah, cause, it's yeah, fascinating. And then the desert side too. Right. Yeah. And so we're up in the tropical uh, kind of the. I forget. I don't even know where it was on the island. Jesse just drove me around. Like yeah. Just, like the kindest, nicest host and friend. Like you know, it's, uh, I always say like my friends are the people who I share drinks with and have you know 
share a meal with. Yeah. And like he just drove me around the aisle, island and we drank and we ate and we harvested bark and swam in the ocean and went back and drank more. And, you know, it was like a tropical vacation with a, with a purpose. Though. That's so great. I spent like three or four days there. Mm-hmm. And it took a couple of days to get the bark. But it, it was just such a, you know, it, bartenders are cool people. They're just very social and they want to be kind and they want to be, you know, uh, you know, recognized for what they do because that, that's our industry. It's hospitality. Mm-hmm. And Jesse, like, embodied that perfectly. Um, so it, it's fun to actually work on something because it, it, it definitely does not feel like a job mm-hmm. when you're doing this. But the hard part was getting it back. So I flew from uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands back into the U- U.S. and to Detroit. So I had to get the bark, explain to custom agents what the stuff was. Because, you know, you're carrying around strange materials in your suitcases. Yeah. You know, always raise, raises flags, especially... Uh, but to get into into Canada, I didn't want to take the risk that I would get um, seized. Mm-hmm. Because I was worried that, oh, if I'm bringing in biological material, this might be a problem. So what I did is I drove to a, um, a Walmart or something, you know, Target, and then I bought, like, these big jars, like, really big, like, one-gallon mason jars. Mm-hmm. I bought two of them, and then I drove across the street to the liquor store. I bought, uh, since I was going to be putting this in an oak barrel, a used oak barrel, I just bought two handles of Canadian whiskey, mm-hmm. filled each one, stuffed the bark into it, and then filled it with the uh, the Canadian whiskey, and then put the lids on it, and then it was pickled. And uh, or the idea that there's alcohol in there, so nothing could, nothing biological could survive. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got across the border. <laughs> wow! Canada. You started your infusion yeah, early. So, yeah, really early. But then I, uh, I had already talked to these. Uh, there's a new distillery in Niagara Falls opening up called Dillon's, and they're still doing awesome. You know, it's good to have local distilleries. Um, but they're like, sure, uh, we'll help you. We'd love to, because they just open up. And, you know, I uh, I exchange some, like I do presentations at Toronto Cocktail Week, and they'd be my sponsor. And they didn't have to pay me. I just did the, the presentation for free. In exchange, they bought me a, you know, used Four Roses uh, barrel, and that was what the... Uh, uh, bitters went into, and there's like 20 pounds of spices and herbs that went into this barrel. Wow. A muslin sack, and then they gave me the distillate, which was a, a high corn wine. Uh, so they made the distillate, and we you know, worked on it, and then I gave them lots of bitters for free, you know, to make sure everybody's happy. But so many people helped me out, and it was just like, you know, nobody ever asked for money. Everybody just wanted to be part of it, and that, was, that for me was the, the peak, you know, the best thing that could happen. You have people helping you and then you want to help them. And it was just fun. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Great story. Oh, and some shop talk. Were you, was it mostly dried ingredients that you were using or was any of it, any of the herbs you were using, were they fresh? Was it all dried? It was all dried. Uh, the recipe called, I, I think I have the recipe online now in our drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody can go look at it. Because I eventually did a presentation at Tales the cocktail in 2016. I've done like tales for 10 years in a row, so I always forget the, which presentations went with which year, but yep. I gave away the whole formula and, you know, because I, I don't want to keep this to myself because, again, so many people helped me and to have this recipe just go back into hiding seemed wrong. Yeah. But, uh, so, you know, the community helped me, so I just give it back to the community. That's cool. And then later, it seemed like somebody from the family got involved or, or something, and um, Abbott's was was revived by someone a couple years later or well, so. Yeah, that was. But it was, it's not the real Abbott. It's not okay. It's not so the original recipe. This, yeah, and the I did a whole bunch of genealogy to connect Joe Abbott with the Abbott's family, and this was all in the presentation I did at Tales. And I had you know a whole bunch of uh, people. I just put it out there so people could, uh, you know, see my research. I had, like, Jeff Berry and Matt Rowley um, on the panel. There's a couple other people there, too. I forget at the moment. But uh, basically, I brought in all my peers like, that I could. Mm-hmm. Like, the people who do research on a regular basis and look up old hot cocktails. And, like, Jeff Berry's fantastic at it. Like, he really... Oh, yeah. Like, if you've ever seen how much you've seen his books but you oh yeah realize like what he goes to to dig in and you want somebody like that who will look at your research and say you know that's plausible mm-hmm. um because there's you know you're, 
history erases a lot of things, so you have to make some leaps of faith. Yeah. But I can easily, in the genealogy, I can connect Job Abbott to the actual Abbott's family, and, uh, you know, it all seems to work out, and bitters taste pretty close to the original Abbott's. They were amazing. So we got, I think we bought three or four bottles for the Bard Husk and just made um, a really fancy Manhattan out of him. And we tried to keep him around for as long as we could. Um, it was a yeah. sad day when we ran out because I was like, this is it. You know, yeah. this is it. <laughs> I wish I could make more, but it's such an expensive project. Like, I mean, to get the bark, like I, I had to fly down there and, you know, stay in a hotel. Like, yeah. like thousands of dollars just to get one ingredient. Like, um, and I had to price them fairly high because of the, uh, the expense, but it, uh, and also the, the rarity of the, the bark. And it's this idea that, you know what, I put them out there. If somebody else wants to create it and, you know, find a, a source for it, they're more than welcome. But the people who make the Abbots now, uh, they are following what was an old recipe that was reverse engineered by, I forget his name, but he used to be on the Drink Boy forums. Mm-hmm. And he ran a sample of Robert's old Abbott through a GC mass spectrometer. Ooh. That was connected to a perfume database, and then it picked out the uh, herbs and spices or the aromatic profile of that, and they kind of roughed it out that way. Now, I use that research in my presentation because I can match all the herbs and spices that are in the Abbott's patent to what came out in that GC mass spec data. But the problem with the GC mass spec data is that it doesn't give an accurate quantity. Mm-hmm. And it really over, for some reason, how the sample is prepared, uh, like did an exceeding amount of clove. And so when you, th- I've actually got a bottle of that Abbott's and it just tastes like clove. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the subtle, smooth flavor that uh, the one I developed had. So yeah, the, for sure. They just took the old mass spec data and it, it, the mass spec data was great. Like it was very helpful. It's like a fingerprint, but it definitely won't give you the formula. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Um, does it surprise yeah, you? Lot, oh, go ahead. The bitters. No, no, there's just a lot of bitters if you really think about it. Like, this project was, like, it took me years to do this. And that, um, but again, you know, that's the type of research that people really like or want. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor this episode, Jones Tree Care, located in East Nashville, Tennessee. They've been around for a while, folks, and... Let me tell you something. They're ethical, they're professional, and they're affordable. They're well insured for both your needs and their employees. Call Jones Tree Care at 262-1134 in the 615 area code. Jones Tree Care prides itself on punctuality, affordability, and quality. They do everything, y'all. They do pruning, they do trimming, they do tree removal, they do Stump grinding, you got a stump in your yard that you just like let sit there forever. Come on, get it taken care of. Call Jones, Peter Jones, Jones Tree Care, where they're hugging the good trees and they're cutting up the bad ones into itsy bitsy pieces. Jones Tree Care, get you some. Yeah, I feel like one thing that I'm, I've am started to talk to, you know, it's like this is something you talk to bartenders about in hushed tones or whatever that like, God, it doesn't seem like Angostura is as good as it used to be or, you know, some of these bigger bitters brands, they really don't seem to be as good as they used to be. What would you attribute that to or do you do or do you uh, not agree with that? But do, would that be an ingredient thing? Like, are they just do you think recipes have changed? Uh, I think it's a supply issue. So yeah. Angostura for the longest time, like people would buy a bottle and that would last like five years. And then all of a sudden, this new bartending wave came through kind of early 2000s and really started to peak in the last 10 years. And everybody had to use bitters. So um, before, we're the, like something like Angostura, and I don't know whether they're doing this or not, but uh, if you all of a sudden go from selling you know, 100,000 bottles a year to selling millions a year, you know, you got to expand and maybe you don't age things as long or keep them... Or you have to, when you're sourcing your herbs and spices, you may not be able to get the quality stuff you had before because you're ordering such a large quantity. Mm -hmm. You have to go to lesser suppliers. 
and you know, anytime with expansion, that is a problem. So it's you know, you see it in wine. You know, when a, a wine becomes popular, it becomes more of a brand. Um, sure. Old wine is you know they want to sell a million bottles, but their vineyard can only handle like ten thousand. So the, or ten thousand cases, but so they buy wine or buy grape must from other vineyards in the area, and obviously it's not always the quality, but it, uh, at a certain point, people don't really care as long as they have bitters in their cocktail. And it's that's something that we see with beer out here in America. I feel like too with the craft beer explosion and all that, um, beer brands that get pretty big pretty fast, and then you know the beers don't really taste the same. And I, I just think that's just part of it. That's part of drinking and yeah. And- yeah, but uh, there are some brands that you know stay small. They just raise their price, and that's a good way to do it too. You know, others just want to be big, and that's fine too. You know, there's something for everybody out there. It's way better than it used to be like 30 years ago. Are you so? We talk about like bitters, which is a great way to season a cocktail. It's just it's it's essential for making cocktails, making classics, what have you. Bars need to have it. Now, acid phosphate and lactart are similar in that they are really nice seasonings. You could argue that they're even more so. They are seasonings because they're meant to increase the flavor of something. Now, are you kind of surprised that there's just not more products like that, like how lactart went at acid phosphate um, and there was competition there? Now you're making both of those, which is cool. You've, you've, you've brought to life these things and, and brought those back, but are you surprised there's not more things like that? Uh, I think they're... They're trying, but uh, again, there's only so many acids you can work with. Like, there really isn't, uh, like, people are you trying to use vinegar and, you know, shrubs, and that works, but shrubs were never popular historically. They were, you know, um, I didn't find any of them in old soda fountain manuals. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was this, like, historically, vinegar was always seen as, like, subpar, because it has that, you know, strong flavor it's great in pickles but not in cocktails yeah unless you're doing a pickleback that is perfect <laughs> yep. um, but it's this idea that there's all these ingredients but you know trying to change the car so i had i was lucky i had i found the soda fountain stuff and there's a, a big historical basis that even some old people remember you know they remember there's i get lots of emails from like people in their 80s 70s and 80s saying thanks for bringing this back because it reminds me of my childhood those are the kind of cool emails. Yeah. Um, but I have this historical um, backing. So when you go to create something brand new, you kind of have to prove yourself. And so there's, there's a big hurdle there. And that uh, people want familiar. Uh, it's one of those things is that, uh, you know, Manhattans. I like my Manhattans. One, like, I'll drink all sorts of Manhattans, but I do like my Manhattans a certain way. And mm-hmm. most customers do, too. So trying to offer new drinks that are interesting and have new acids, like even getting people over the bitters hump was a little bit of a challenge. That took like 12 years Yeah, from the early days until, you know, five years ago. Like now it's just accepted that you use bitters, but it wasn't always that easy. Well, and Negroni was a cocktail that was like really just not called for much, say 15 years ago. And now it's like, yeah. not only is it ubiquitous, but you have companies here in the States making Campari-like spirits that are, you know, arguably better than Campari and really, really good. So it's just and crazy. That's, and that's the reality is if, if you can pr- improve on something, that's where you're going to have a lot more luck getting people to change. Are there are there some other things you came across in researching for Fix the Pumps and writing Fix the Pumps? Um, different extracts or bitters or flavors at all that that you came across that you that still kind of you wonder about or you you feel like could be brought back oh yeah tons of stuff and it's um like i can't think of uh, in the bibliography of fix the pumps i list all the books that or a good chunk of the books that i used as resources and one of them the best one is uh the standard manual of soda and it's from 1901, 1899, I think there's a couple editions. Mm. But that one's just so full of information on, like, and not somewhere, you know, these hybrid things that aren't quite bitters, they're not quite liqueurs, they're uh, these creations that don't even have a name, but they just fit into this, you know, at the back of a, a, a soda manual. And it, it creates a 
this kind of thing where it's like, you know, how would you categorize that? And, you know, I should make that. But then a lot of them have like 20 ingredients in. And Are they alcohol based? And all that. so, yeah. It, um, so this manual was designed to give, like, if you're opening a soda fountain, you would buy the standard manual of soda. Mm-hmm. And that would be your guide. And it would give you everything in it, like all these old egg drinks and, you know, mineral waters. So the mineral salts. And I've toyed with this idea before of starting, you know, one of the, if you're, I'm not excessively environmental, but I do think certain things are dumb, like shipping water across an ocean. Yeah. You know, why should we buy like Perrier and spend so much money to ship that bottle across an ocean and basically pollute the environment when back in the old days they used to actually just analyze the soda fountain or the the soda water get the mineral content make the minerals and then add that to carbonated water and you'd have something pretty similar Mm -hmm. and it's just way more it seems and they did that because you know they knew shipping water back in the 1800s across an ocean was dumb yeah (laughs) still had sailboats and it, it just wasn't profitable to do that so they use chemistry to solve that problem. And I think chemistry is where we should go today. Mm-hmm. Because, and I think there are actually a couple of people that are doing something like this. Um, I've seen Camper English talk about something similar. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you could, if you stop shipping water like San Pellegrino and Perrier and all those other European mineral waters, if you stop shipping them to the United States or Canada, um, just think how many ships would stop burning fuel, and you could still have something that's similar. You can actually make something better. Yeah. You're just using whatever comes out of the ground. Could you imagine, like, doing the experiments? Maybe I should at some point in time. But you can actually probably create some pretty tasty mineral waters that, you know, you just put a teaspoon into a liter or a teaspoon, a couple teaspoons into a gallon, and, you know, you have your own house mineral water. Oh, those, like, mineral salts? Yep. Yeah. yeah and most that's of the fascinating. Salts are usually available but it's that kind of, that kind of stuff that uh when i was writing text of the pumps i was like oh that's just another rabbit hole that you know maybe i'll save that for another book but i have never i haven't gotten around to writing another book yet mm-hmm. you know, kids take a lot of time and that uh, maybe my son's in his teenage years now so i think it uh in a few years i might have like a lot of free time but you know writing a book with having kids bug you i have a lot of respect for people who do that uh, I need a little more focus on that. Yeah, no, it's tough. It's yeah, you you go early morning, you go late night, you go up to a room and say, "Please, I'm going to lock this door." <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what is so fascinating, though, about um, a lot of these soda parlors from a hundred years ago, 120 years ago, is that they were making this mineral water, but they you had to have a chemist on staff, you had to have a pharmacist on staff. And that's that's what you don't see anymore. Right. You don't see those two worlds. Yeah, was, yeah and it was that basically you had to have a university education to open a pharmacy, and then the soda fountain went with it because, you know, um, well, some of the drugs were dispensed in soda. So cocaine, mm-hmm. which was so super popular at soda fountains back in the 1880s. Yeah. And Coca-Cola wasn't the only one that was doing that. And, uh, but yeah, you know, you had to make sure you got the right dose. And they were using small doses, like 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams. I've never done cocaine, but uh, I'm sure that's enough to give you a little bit of a buzz because people definitely liked Coca-Cola for yeah. that period of time. Yeah, just crazy to think you could go down, like, I need a little jolt. I'm just going to go down to the uh, soda parlor and grab a cocaine soda real quick, and I'll be feeling real good. Yeah, and my favorite term, they used to call it brain food. Brain food. <laughs> oh, wow. Brain food. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the 80s they called it that in Hollywood. Probably, but it's this idea that they, uh, you know, it took lawyers and doctors would use it because it, you know, made the help them focus. And uh, so it wasn't seen as bad until like three years after somebody binged on it. So it wasn't seen as badly as alcohol was because alcohol, you know, poor quality alcohol and too much of it makes people belligerent and pick fights and stuff. Yeah. Whereas cocaine at that time, and there's a lot of other drugs that they put in sodas, but uh, they were seen as medicinal. You know, your pharmacist was giving to you, so it wasn't seen as bad. Well, do you think there was as much of a communal aspect to that soda parlor as 
what you know what bars became and and what bars sort of were back then as well but do you think that 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 was a part of that old soda fountain too was there like a communal aspect to it people could go down there and just hang out nope. for a while nope complete opposite and soda fountains didn't even have stools yeah so okay the idea of a soda was you, you, you drank it in five minutes and you're out so people used to line up at it get the soda and be gone mm. and uh they didn't have disposable cups at that time like they didn't have paper cups so you just had to be quick because sodas were designed to drink quickly. You weren't supposed to, you generally didn't hang out. Uh, later on, right, like during Prohibition, when the, the food counters and the Sundays started coming out in the early 1900s, like 1910, and the banana splits, then it started becoming a little more social, but more for teenagers. But in the 1800s, like 1880s, there was no stools at the, the soda fountains. You walked in, you chugged your drink, and you're out. Yeah, and that, it was more like a therapy, like, man, like I, I got to go do my 10 minutes in the sauna or something, but instead of that, you're going to have like a cocaine soda with... Yeah, a diuretic or... Yeah, diuretic, or yeah. Cocaine or, yeah, whatever, you know, they had all sorts of stuff, so, and then people just developed, you know, some people just wanted a soda, and uh, so uh, it was just one of those things that uh, you didn't have the social aspect, though they were held to a higher social standard. So pharmacists at that time wanted their soda fountains to look beautiful because they're medical professionals. So they had gold gilded Tiffany lamps and onyx bars and marble. And you see through these old newspaper articles how, like, they bragged about how much they were spending. They were importing the finest marble from Italy. Mm -hmm. And they wanted these things to look beautiful. And one thing that I have never seen is a color photo of one of those soda fountains from that time period hmm. and that is kind of one of the things that i would love to see or just get yeah, someone really good at colorizing what it it's this idea that they used to put so much money and effort whereas bars they didn't you know mm -hmm. um some bars they may have like hotel bars but most bars were just like a wooden bench and a, and a step rail and a spittoon and um they didn't have to be fancy the yeah alcohol was the attraction Whereas when you're going to buy your medical supplies, even for, you know, your aspirin and your, you know, whatever you needed, you wanted to go someplace that looked respectable. You didn't want to go to, like, something that looked like a dingy bar to buy your medicines from. So you've become a, a, a farmer and gardener and living out in the country. Tell me a little bit about I that. Have. Do you guys have animals and stuff? And have you, you've, you've seemed to have gotten really into that nice to live out in the country there's you know it uh you have the freedom to do stuff and so i've been gardening for i don't know six or seven years mm -hmm. so one of the things that you'll often find is that if you're stressed out gardening get your hands dirty it's just so relaxing and you know they estimate that it's because humans have been gardening for about eighty thousand years it's yep. become part of us and one of the best ways to you know reduce stress is just to act like a human being be kind garden, you know, eat good food, laugh, have a drink. You know, those are all things that humans have been doing for thousands of years. So when you do that, uh, you'll find that you just get pulled into it. Yeah. There's something fun about watching your kids pull garlic out of the garden. So that, uh, we haven't, my daughter wanted a goat at one point in time, but uh, I didn't want to go. <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, it, uh, there's a reason Satan looks like a goat. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit hard to deal with at times but anyway we've had chickens and ducks for years and that uh ducks are good in the garden they don't dig everything up chickens are terrible they uh but it's this idea you can kind of you know get out and do stuff and it's a great distraction from your uh day-to-day -day work definitely yeah there's nothing like uh just putting your hands in dirt and you know working the soil and just bringing you back to your center a little bit i totally agree with that what is the next? Uh, what's the next year have in store for you, and what kind of projects are you going to be working on? Well, there's a big project I've just been working on in the last. I can't say anything yet, but uh, uh, it's still drink related, but and farm related. But I have to get another piece of property to do it. But oh wow! It works actually. It works. Yeah. So it uh, uh, it might be an interesting one, and see, I've always wanted to open a distillery, but the tax 
on it just too high in Canada, and it just doesn't work out. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna try some other things. But I've done the soda fountain thing. I've done the bartending thing. So on to my next thing. But hopefully, in like a couple of weeks, I'll be able to announce something. Yeah, cool. Well, that's great. Are you? Uh, did you? Did you have your own soda parlor at one point? No, but I, see, I've always been taught, thought about this. Like, there's a cool little town, little beach town called Grand Bend, and. I've been going, everybody who's a teenager goes there, and it's just kind of a beach town with, you know, a main drag and, like, you know, 10,000 cottages. The population, like, quadruples in the summer, Mm -hmm. and then the winter, it's, like, dead. But it's just, you know, it's got a main drag and all sorts of ice cream and restaurants and things. So I always thought it would be, like, the perfect place for a soda fountain. But again, with kids, uh, you know, Committing to that is, uh, and committing to my kids' time. Uh, I've decided that uh, I'll spend more time with my kids right now, and you know, in a couple of years, they're going to be teenagers, so I can put them to work. <laughs> there you go. But it's this idea that it's kind of you know, when they're younger, you kind of got a little bit more responsibility with them. For and sure. As they get older, they can actually work with you. So I think that's the goal. And you might write another book someday. Yeah. Once they, again, once the kids stop bugging me. Um, yeah. I love them. They're great but they do know how to hit you right in the middle of a good sentence. Yeah, as we saw earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this was great, man. Thank you so much for talking to us, talking to me. I've been a fan of yours for a long time and just really appreciate all the, the detail and all the work that you've done to, to bring a lot of this knowledge to light and uh, and and keep, keep it going with the acid phosphate and the lactart. So, People can buy acid phosphate and lactate from you at artofdrink.com. Is that correct? Is that the best place? Yep, that's the best place. Awesome. And you've got yeah, a, a lot you. of great uh, historical anecdotes on there. You you write about a lot of different like milkshake and cool soda shop stuff, cocktail stuff. And I have to say that when I um, – the first time I made your Orjot recipe must have been eight years ago or so – it's a great recipe. I don't know if that's still on your site, but that's the one I always kind of yeah, reference yeah. back to because you do the three rounds of extraction or so. Yeah, that one still actually gets a fair number of hits. And, you know, it, uh, it's actually in one of Jeff Berry's books. He, he liked it too, so he included the recipe. <laughs> oh, that's great. I don't. I didn't remember that. Or maybe that's where I saw it yeah. for, the first, for the first time, but I, th- I feel like I saw it on your blog originally, but... One of the earliest recipes that I put together was some like tasting and redoing and tasting and redoing, and then wrote it up. And that was uh, probably like 2006, and that one stood the test of ta- time. Like that, that one I'm really happy with because it's a good recipe. It's solid. Um, so when we did we did a show on Orchard when we were back when we were doing like Tiki Month a couple, almost a couple years ago now. We did a whole episode on Orjat and talked about your recipe and um, talked about different methods, how it's all about kind of no matter what you're making, if you're doing almonds or a different nut or different seeds or something, it's all about that extraction. So Yeah, you know, get that flavor out. Yeah, very cool. Um, so thanks to all you've contributed to, to how we drink here. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I love doing this stuff because I, I still love this community. Like, it's a fun community and uh, anytime I get a chance to talk to them or share my knowledge happy to do it well uh thanks so much for taking the time and uh we will uh we'll look forward to um your next project let us know and we'll uh we'll talk about it here on liquid gold thank you very much what's up mike this is a booze news alert the king lebron james the king four-time nba champion four-time NBA MVP has just signed a lucrative endorsement deal with PepsiCo going against his past 17 years representing Sprite and Powerade for the Coca-Cola company. LeBron allowed that contract to, to end and presumably is getting more aligned with his own personal politics now. Coca-Cola is known as a somewhat conservative company where PepsiCo um, is a little bit more towards the left. LeBron represented the Sprite brand for Coca-Cola and uh, Powerade, and I encourage you to watch those uh, 
watch those commercials that he made um, in, in case like you want to know something about LeBron, LeBron James and you don't you don't particularly care for basketball like myself and Mike that's fine just uh, YouTube uh, LeBron James and Sprite there's so many of these like really great mini movies that he made they're hilarious they're cute they're charming they make you laugh they make you cry not the power aids though those aren't really that great um anyway lebron will be likely representing uh the mountain dew brand for pepsico who has had a rough time ever since the mid 90s when surge came out and uh, kind of took the wind out of their sails they've never really felt very confident about their brand ever since then. So hopefully LeBron can do for the do what the do is do. And fuck Coca-Cola, man. Like uh, the last time I had a Coca-Cola, I was sitting in a park in Redding, California. I had a Mexican Coke, of course. And someone came up, this old lady, and she was like, Oh, a Mexican Coca-Cola, you know, like, and she, I'm like, don't do it. And she was like, you know, like, Mexican Coca-Cola is made with real sugar. And I'm like, God damn it. Yes, yes. And then the American brand is corn syrup. I get it. I get it. I get it. You you want to recite. You want to recite information to a stranger. I know the game. That's all I do. And Speaking of a Coca-Cola product that incites a similar reaction, just has like uh, lower calories, is Topo Chico. Y'all were talking about it earlier, and um, I get what Darcy and you were saying about uh, the minerality. It tastes great, and uh, it's got a little salinity to it. The bubbles are like blue, blue, blue. but I'd be damned if I can drink a Topo Chico without someone saying, "Oh, Topo Chico." I'm from California. I didn't know y'all had that here in Tennessee. I'm like, well, it's owned by Coca-Cola. They're pretty much everywhere. Like, you could probably go to Antarctica, lady. Can you go to Antarctica and see if they have Topo Chico there? Because they probably do. But can you go there? Please. I mean, what's the deal with Topo Chico? Like, especially the 12 ounces. The glass is heavier than the water, and the water is filled with air. Now, LeBron is expected to make about $40 million under contract with the uh, the Los Angeles Lakers this year. And that's, pr that's pretty freaking great. But he's also expected to make about $60 million in endorsements, which wows us. I thought that was a lot. And then I found out that it wasn't a lot compared to what I consider the athletic equivalent of two Benadryl and shower steam, Roger Federer is supposed to make $100 million this year. I can see why he signed with Pepsi. Congratulations to the Kang. Mike, love you. All right, thanks so much to Kenneth Dedman, Booze News, Anchorman himself, and Darcy O'Neill. Thanks so much to Darcy for talking to us today. Had a great chat with him, and uh, he'll be appearing on our Egg Cream Shots episode coming up for our next episode. And uh, you can always go back and check out all the other topics that we've done here on Liquid Gold. So go back on weownthistown.net and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Email us, liquidgoldpod at gmail.com, and find us on Instagram at liquidgold underscore pod. Shout out to Jess Matchin for the lovely Liquid Gold logo and to Upright T-Rex Music for the tunes. Shout out to producer Michael Eads and everybody at WeOwnThisTown.net. For my co-host, Mr. Kenneth Dedman and cocktail correspondent Jessica Backus, my name's Mike Wolf. We will see you next time on Liquid Gold. Later, Tater.